brilliant. Okay, everybody, we are uh, we're having quite a quick turnaround. There was months and months went by uh, between our, our our last episode and the one previous to that, but it's a really quick turnaround today, and we're on to episode sixty seven with uh, one of my oldest friends, uh, Ajmal, and I go back sort of many many years. And it's going to be brilliant today to to finally get a chance to spend an hour with you and and and, and catch up properly. So uh, episode sixty seven of the Marshall Focus podcast, and a huge big welcome to Ashmal Mustak. How are you, Ashmal? Very well, Kareem. Great to see you again, and delighted to be on here talking about all things martial art related. Brilliant, brilliant. It's a. Uh... So we just had a wee chat before we started recording there about how old we've both got. Uh, I started Taekwondo when I was five. Uh, and what age would you have been when, when we first started training together? I started when I was 10. And I think you started just after me, maybe a few months after me. Wow, it's unbelievable. And I, I'm 42 now. And for the record, Ajmal is now 49. So he's got a, a big birthday coming up as well. The big 5-0. It's actually scary where the time goes. It just it, it really, really is, and, and it just passes so quickly. So anybody within our local Hamilton, Glasgow, Scotland area, and probably beyond that now, uh, may have heard about uh, Ashmal and the amazing success he's had. He's uh, pretty much a bit of a business guru now, uh, hugely successful businessman and entrepreneur. But what a lot of people don't know, and, and maybe some of them do, is that you're also a black belt who passed uh, your black belt testing under none other than Grandmaster He El Cho. Uh, and we graded together, actually, back in 1993, which, again, is just is just mind-blowing. Uh, also, back in 1990, Ajmal was the European Taekwondo champion, which was a, a huge achievement and, and obviously still is. Everybody knows the standard of European and, and world, uh, world championship level. So it's just... It's amazing to to have you on. Uh, you. Let let's go right back to the beginning, actually, and 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 let's think about some of those memories that you have, uh, just those formative years within Taekwondo and martial arts. What 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 can you remember from from back then? I remember it was Joe McClear. I uh, went to my dad's restaurant and got talking to him, and he convinced uh, my dad that he should get his kids into Taekwondo, and my dad thought. Yeah, I think if the boys can stand up for themselves and know how to fight, that's a good thing. So we started um, when I was very young, about 10 years old. Uh, me and my brother started, then my cousins started, uh, then even more cousins started. Then all of a sudden there were 10 of us um, started more or less at the same time. And then I remember you started as well shortly after that. So all of a sudden you had like... Uh, 10, 12, 14 people from the ethnic minorities in this club. And it was just fantastic. Um, and it was just, uh, it, it, it was pretty good fun because we would all turn up and it was just a bit of a carry on in the very early years, wasn't it? For sure, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. The th Things have obviously changed over the years. Uh, but, but what hasn't changed is the is the benefits that people get. Uh, and many of them can be surprising to a lot of people, not only to the kids and the students, but also to the parents. So when your dad had, had taken you and enrolled you into classes, do you remember back then him or you being surprised by what you were actually getting involved in rather than just somewhere to go and do some martial arts? No, Karim, when you're a kid and you're doing something, you don't actually realise that if you're doing anything, it's often the case you don't realise the benefit until a few years down the line. I was probably about 35 years old. Like, this is 25 years after, one quarter century after I started, that I actually realised the real benefit of martial arts. Yeah. At that time, you're turning up, you're doing stretching, you're doing warm-ups, you're doing patterns, you're doing a bit of sparring. Some of it's boring, some of it's good, some of it's interesting. Um, but the real benefit of martial arts, I realized when I was age 35, it's the discipline. It's the turning up when you don't want to. It's doing the boring tasks like stretching. Who in the hell likes stretching for 20 minutes before every session? 
it's the 10 minute warm up it's the jogging around the the hall boring mundane tasks and it's only when i was about 35 years old i realized that is the perfect reflection of life you have to turn up when you don't want you have to do the boring tasks and you have to embrace all of these if you want to achieve success yep um, um, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I'm very scared that straight away both of us will turn into uh, two boring old men talking about how it was in the old days. However, we trained on, on a cold stone floor in the old sports barn in Hamilton. Uh, those were definitely formative years. There was no fancy matted floors and, and equipment, etc., etc. So uh, showing up and doing jogging in 20 minutes as you say of stretching most sessions on that frozen cold floor definitely built character <laughs> and, and i'll raise you on that right we achieved black belts when it took like seven eight years to get a black belt there's many organizations and clubs now where you can get a black belt within two years this was hardcore old school and if your foot is out of position if yep. your arm is slightly out of a position, the instructor would come over and kick you in the stomach. Uh, does that happen these days? Uh, it, it doesn't. Do you know, I nearly slipped there and said, unfortunately, it doesn't. And, and let me clarify that because like many things, we obviously move on. Uh, one of the things, in fact, I would say the main thing that I've took from back then to try and, and ensure that we continue doing in my own school now is, is making people work for that black belt. We we do average still about seven, eight, sometimes nine years, uh, depending on how people progress. But the we've moved away from the the, the, the kicking of people. Uh, but it, I look back on that fondly. Uh, you you clearly do. I can see the sort of I can see the the the, the smile in your face and in your eyes as well. Of those were good times. But if you blocked yeah. and you dropped your hand. You did. I, I wonder. I wonder how we got away with it back then, but it definitely was a benefit to us. Do, do, you, do you agree with that? I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it really toughened you up, and there's nothing like getting a kick in the stomach <laughs> <laughs> if you're slightly out of position. Honestly, I, I, and that was that was like a daily occurrence. Yeah. Um, and, and what a difference from then to now. Because I, I came to your school. Remember, I think last year at some point. Um, and Kareem, I've got to say, I admire the fact that you're still soldiering on with Taekwondo. You're probably one of the, and I'll flip something back at you, you're probably one of the world's leading martial artists, right? Uh, and that's a, that's a big boast. And let me quantify that. There, there will be very, very few people who have done martial arts for 35, 40 years consistently. And you've done that. So I reckon you're probably in the top 1% of the world's mar martial artists. So well done for that. That's the second thing I really liked about your school, it was night and day difference between when we were learning. Your, your place now is all about learning, learning at your pace. And there seemed to be much more of a community feel. I remember for the young kids, you're singing happy birthday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all of the kids and they all get together. And that's great because I think that's what you need to bring it together whereas in our day it was just it was just pretty ruthless and brutal it was um, and i remember 10 my cousins there were 10 12 of us started and i was the only one that ended up lasting the course everyone else has dropped off at yellow belt green belt blue belt one of my cousins got to red belt but um yeah what a difference to the way it was they, from back they, say, then. That, they say that one in ten thousand people got a black belt. I think both of us are exceptionally lucky uh, in one sense that our black belt was from Grandmaster Hiel Cho as well, who I've spoke about uh, many, many times in the podcast, but I have a personal belief that that still sets us further apart, but one in 10,000 people. And I used to look at that statistic and think that, that that wasn't as accurate as probably it could be. But now having run the school for, for so long and have having had so many people through the school, I think it's actually pretty accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. As you say, and again, we can hopefully talk about this uh, later in the podcast as well, just about that that staying power and that, that dedication that you took into a hugely successful business career. But 
it's worth it's worth you noting that that you lasted the course because one in ten thousand people to achieve anything is a is mm -hmm. a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Yeah. Do do you know how I credit that to um the the fact that I achieved what I achieved? It was my mother, right? And this is a lesson to all parents because kids make up their own mind and they're like, oh, no, we don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. So 10 of us started, slowly, 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 they all dropped off. There were just two of us left. And my cousin dropped off as well, and that just left me. So I would be turning up to this club, and sometimes there were only a handful of people there. I would turn up to this club, and I wasn't really enjoying it. And I said to my mum, I don't want to go anymore. And my mum turned around and says, you're going to get your black belt. You're going to, you're going to finish this. Um, and I disagreed with her. But I went along anyway, and I'm glad she forced me. And I think in life, parents can often be too too soft in their kids or too too accommodating. But I'm glad my mum says, you're going. You're yeah. going to get your black belt. And I'm glad she did. Because the sense of achievement that we both got from achieving black belts and the success we've had since is just, it, it's something inside you. No one can take it away. Yep. Yeah. Let me just add to that very quickly because I, I do want to quickly get to where you are today because uh, that's really exciting stuff that I want to cover. But I, a quick anecdote, I had a conversation just last night with two individual parents whose young children are inquiring about when they're going to do one of their, their early belt gradings. And we have a grading coming up at the end of the month. And... Now, this is kids that haven't started, just, just very lately they've, they've started. And both parents individually said to me, uh, yes, I'm really keen on them testing and, and going for their grading. Uh, I'm really scared that they'll begin to lose interest. And, and my response to both parents was, well, for a huge part of that, you as the parent are responsible. Not me and, and not the five or six year old child. I think I think what you've said again already is another fantastic snippet that people can straight away take away. I would split it. Uh, looking at the 100%, I would say the responsibility to get a child to black belt would be 25% instructor, 25% student, and the bit that everybody forgets, 50% parent uh, or guardian. It's a huge influence. 100%, even to the point of dropping you off Picking you up, dropping you off, picking you up, dropping you off, picking you up, cancelling your other plans because the kids have got Taekwondo. It, it's it's an incredible sacrifice and undertaking from the parents, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Yep. Right. So, what I want to do is uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I would love you to give us, and again, we've got plenty of time, so as broad an outline as you possibly can of uh, your business successes and uh, your career successes and then we can both of us know that that in many ways relates back to those skills you learned in martial arts but let's yeah. give us a wee picture just now of how your business career has went very briefly i studied law at university and then i did a master's in finance i worked with a, a global management consultancy in london a top tier global management consultancy worked there for 10 years achieved everything I wanted to do. The money was great. The lifestyle was great. Jet set lifestyle. But there was a burning desire inside me to run my own business. So I started my own business in Hamilton. Um, and I managed to grow it to being a, a massive, mega, multi-million pound organization. Um, sold that. And now in the last couple of years, I've started a new venture called Boss Pizza. And the aim for Boss Pizza is to roll that out nationally across the country. As aside from all of this, I love talking about business. I am a business geek. I could talk about business all day long. Um, and I think that's one thing that sets me apart. I love the craft of business and I and I execute against that craft day in, day out. And I think that's what one of the things that sets me apart. So for me to turn up and do a 15-hour day in business is like a walk in the park. Um, so I've, I've had tremendous success. Um, I'm married. I've got a 13 year old son, eight year old daughter. We live, a, a, we live a fantastic lifestyle. All because I made a, a six year sacrifice at the start of my business career. The first six years of my business life, I didn't see my family, friends, my um, my son, and it was an incredible sacrifice. And people say you shouldn't have done that, but I'm glad I did because that is 
that has made me the man I am today, and it allows me to live the life of live such a fantastic life. You know, it's there's no decision that we make that's based around money or finances. Everything is just everything is just in place, and I'm glad I made those sacrifices to achieve the business success. Yep. The what's the saying? Do something for yourself today that you'll thank yourself tomorrow for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously that was a six-year period for yourself. But already yeah. we're seeing uh, relations between the, the, the challenges of and the sacrifice of martial arts and taekwondo training and mm. and business, or not even business success, but life. Yeah. Uh, what part of your... What part of your mindset and character were you digging into during those six difficult years of setting your life up, knowing or hoping that in the future it was going to be worth it? Talk to us a wee bit about those sort of darker places where you had to really dig in to, to get through those. Uh, yeah, I would work nine o'clock to four o'clock, go home for one hour and then start from five o'clock and work to midnight. Did that six years straight. Um, six years straight, seven days a week. Um, and Karima, it's an incredibly lonely place. Um, being successful is a lonely place. Being at the top is lonely. And being on that journey is a very lonely place. Let me tell everyone watching this podcast, when you start out in business, everyone is cheering for you. Your friends, your family, your colleagues, everyone. Fast forward a year, the colleagues have dropped away. Fast forward two years, the family's dropped away. Fast forward three, four years, even your parents are thinking, "Are you? is this the right thing for you? Fast forward five years, my wife turned around to me and says, in the darkest time, she says, this was your dream. Um, and I'm alone, at my loneliest time, my, my wife said to me, you know, it, it's your, you, it was your dream. And... I was quite happy in London living, you know, a great lifestyle, working for a great company. So understand this. If you want to achieve something insanely successful, the more successful you get, the closer you get to your goal, the lonelier it's going to get. Again, I I can only relate that back to the martial arts. And you've already said something on the podcast, which... I understand is on a different level, but they're definitely definitely relatable. And that was about your cousin, your cousins dropping away. Mm. Okay. And I have this conversation with parents, especially of children and teenagers, and also adults who are heading towards that that goal of black belt. And you know, until you had actually just said that, I hadn't actually, uh, and I've thought about this a lot of ways. I haven't really thought about it being a lonely place and what a brilliant way for you to describe that there uh, because if I'm thinking of teenagers at the moment they're friends why are you doing this crazy thing let's do this and then even parents thinking how much are we sacrificing how much time do we need to sacrifice but you're living proof that going through that and and, and, and walking your own walk Loneliness is 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 it's right there in the title. You're you're alone. It's your thing. Yet look at you now because you made it through. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. And, and let me talk about Usain, Usain Bolt. Everyone, because everyone can relate to Usain Bolt. They know that he's the fastest, or he was the fastest man in the world. He didn't have his friends and colleagues running alongside him at four o'clock in the morning. He, he didn't have his friends around him when they were partying on Saturday night. He was in the gym training. So for him, it would be an incredibly lonely journey. And I think success is the ability to embrace loneliness for long periods of time. And if you can do that, you maximize your chances of success. How do you, or what skills did you learn regarding mindset and focus? And again, this is something that goes hand in hand with martial arts, whether it's competing, uh, whether it's going for black belt or, or anything at all. Uh, did you have that mindset or, or is that a skill that you, you you developed along the way? So back to when I was um, a teenager doing taekwondo, 
I was learning the skills, but see, at that time, you don't actually realize that what you're learning is much more than the physical movements of martial arts. You're learning the skills, and I only realized this many years later, that I have those skills, and I was able to apply them to my business easily. And those skills were working in a team. They were turning up when you don't want to. They were embracing the boring stretching routines for 20 minutes before every session. Um, they were turning up on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock when you need a lion. All of these skills are relevant in the business world or any endeavor where you want to be successful. You're not going to be motivated all of the time. You are going to be, there are going to be times where you just want to just throw in the towel and, and, and forget about it. Um, but having practiced those skills for years during my martial art years, by default, I was implementing them in my business life without even thinking about them. Well, now that I have you in front of me, uh, this yep. is a wonderful chance, so so let's think about them. Let's maybe go for three or four, or wherever the discussion takes us, of those skills, and let's see if between us we can really specifically relate them, relate them back. Uh, I think the way... This is the way I would describe it, especially to, to, to younger students and, and the benefits. Uh, here's a really basic one. The, having the confidence to, when when we're sparring or even when we're interacting with students in a, in a martial arts school, building up that confidence to be able to look at a prospective employee in the eye and shake their hand properly or, or speak in public or... Even for the younger children, we talk about being able to to read in the classroom and all these skills that you're, you're spot on. You're absolutely spot on. They don't necessarily realise that they are learning these skills. But uh, let's look at examples where you actually look back and thought, I made a success of this business deal or this venture because you're a Taekwondo black belt. Yeah, uh, one of the first things would be standing up and taking a class. You're standing up in front of your students. You're doing the. You're you're practicing your your verbal communication skills. You're you're commanding an audience. You're instructing a group of people, and that can be copied and pasted into the work environment. Yeah. How many people suffer from stage stage fright? One of the things I'm blessed with, and I think I can relate this back to my Taekwondo years. I can stand up in front of you, two people, 2,000 people, 200,000 people, and deliver my message. And I think th that craft was practiced, practiced back in the, in the classrooms of Taekwondo yep. uh, from a very young age, from the age of 16, 17, 18, where the instructor would drop us in and say, I'm going to talk to this parent. You start. You, you, you take care of the, the, the class for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. That, again, I, I'm so... Like all the podcasts that I do, I, I, and I mentioned this to you uh, offline before we, we, we come on, I never ever have questions. I just have some topics and I like the conversation just to flow and go where it goes. But you're bringing in lots of points that are just firing off in my head at the moment. Uh, that one about leaving people, the best way to learn is to teach. I tell my young uh, sort of black tag students or black belt uh, students, especially the teenagers, and you said it yourself, you just drop them in. Drop them into a situation that they're extremely uncomfortable with and then they have to they have to rise to that. Again, yeah. of course, if you're working in business, your circumstances must change by the minute sometimes, never mind the hour or, or the day. So it's having that flexibility to be able to react to situations. It must yeah. be beneficial. Yeah. The right, okay. So let's actually go back a wee bit and if we can, let's we did a wee bit at the beginning, but let's do a wee bit more reminiscing if we possibly can. Uh, right. I want to talk about your European title as well because that's that that that's a huge deal. And I'm gonna be honest, back when you won your European title, and this will be controversial, people won't like this, but it would have been a, a better success in many ways than what it is now, because unfortunately, martial arts and even the tournaments that people compete in are very diluted now. They're very right. diluted. Uh, where you could possibly have to have six or seven 
matches on an any on a in a championship, you see people winning Scottish, British, European championships with two fights now. Yeah, uh, so all right, guys. There's so many, there's so many championships. So uh, that's a huge taekwondo success. Let's. <laughs> This is the first time this trophy, the European Taekwondo champion, this is the first time I've taken this trophy out ever from a, from a house. So I, I knew, knew we were going to talk about this. Um, so that is a trophy. It's a heavy one. It, it's great. And it's probably one of my biggest sporting achievements. Well, it is my biggest sporting achievement. And it's something I'm very proud of. Okay, so let's talk about, let, let's, let's do a deep dive into the psyche behind winning um, a major title. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yes. Okay, I'll start. Right, okay, so this is the European Taekwondo champion that I won in 1990, right? In order for me to win this title, I'm going to put it up right now. In order for me to win that title, I had to undertake years of activities that were simply boring. Stretching, warming up turning up when I don't want to, sacrificing my, my lions on a Sunday morning. And I think it's exactly the same in life and in business. If you want to achieve something great, the journey is not all happiness, friendship, roses, good times. The journey is hard graft. There is no glory without the graft. That's what I say. And I think for me to win this title, I, I would say there's probably... About 70%, that's very general, but 70% of it was just boring, mundane, repetitive activities. And about 30% of it, of it was would have been enjoyable, fun, sparring, learning new techniques. So 70-30 yeah. split is what I would what I would say to that. Again, again, Ashmael, that is it, it's it's perfect. It's a perfect uh description of of everything in life where one get successful at anything. Uh, how much, let me ask you a, a direct question, actually, it's just popped into my head. As someone who employs many people and has done over the years, and again, this is the, the first rule that I give to my Taekwondo students, how much importance do you put on just showing up? Show up. That, that's, that's a key thing. If you show up, Day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, you put yourself miles ahead of the competition because most people start off strong and then they fall away or they don't have the motivation or the discipline. But showing up consistently is what makes the difference 100%. Back in the day, uh, and even, even now, uh, and I've spoken about this often, I've spoken about this on the podcast as well and on social media and things, there were I, I can think back to all the different stages of my Taekwondo journey and physically and technically uh, and, and, and just skill-wise, I can think of many, many people that were far, far superior to me. Far superior to me. But the reason why, and I, I don't actually, I don't use the master title, but the reason I got the sixth degree black belt, which comes with the master title, was because I showed up and yeah. I never stopped showing up. And you mentioned yeah. that at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, but in any walk of life, it's that consistency and showing up every day, every week, every month, every year, and it, it, it leads to success. It's a hugely important thing. And, okay, Kareem, you, you're, you're a master in Taekwondo now, but I, I, I guarantee you there would have been days, weeks, months, even maybe a period of years where you think, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, am I right in saying that? Hundred percent. Even even to today, you 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 get times when you're you're demotivated and a hundred percent. Yeah, and 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 that's the difference between uh, success and failure. It's just that relentless pursuit and that continuous ability to show up when it matters. Great. Right. Thinking about the non-physical parts of the art. Uh, the tenets, as, as you would remember, mm. we, we now call them the aims to achieve. Uh, we've also added in modesty at the beginning. So your modesty, your courtesy, your integrity. Uh, again, I'm sure you've had to, to to deal with different people in many different ways. But how does that mental and uh, 
spiritual is a strange word. A lot of different people get many things from that, but it definitely shapes our character to learn those lessons through martial arts. How has that helped you deal with the many different ranges of people that you've had to deal with to become as successful as what you are? I think one of the tenets of Taekwondo, I think that the big one is just being respectful to one another. I mean, when you enter the hall, you, you bow. Before you spar someone, you bow. I think respect is probably the, the biggest one uh, for me. Um, and I think that's the way I've, I've continued I've continued that on. You always deal respectfully to every person you interact with, regardless of their level, whether they're the CEO or just entry-level team member, you speak to everyone with the same level of respect. And I think that is probably one of the biggest uh, non-physical things that I've taken away from martial arts. Yep. The... What, what were the other tenets of Taekwondo to remind me? Because I'm old and I've forgotten them now. So you have courtesy, integrity, yep. Yep. perseverance, self-control, yep. an indomitable spirit. And there's, there's a form of... And modesty now. That, that, that's 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 a formula for life, right? For the benefit of the people listening to this podcast, wheel them off one more time, straight off. Go. So you've got modesty, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. So that's our six aims to achieve. Very good. And I'll um I'll uh, expand a little bit on the indomitable spirit because Please. that's one that's not so clear. That is basically when the chips are down. When, when you're up against all odds, you still soldier through and get the result that you want. And that is one of the greatest tenets, I think, in my opinion, of, of, of the six that you've got there in Taekwondo. I don't think you get to I don't think you get to the level of success that you have achieved uh, without having that moral uh, backbone, that 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 inner strength, and again, many of the, the people who've gone before me, many of the sort of giants whose shoulders I stand on, uh, talk about this often. If you think about the millions of people, the millions of people who can kick us away up at sort of 12 o'clock and jump and spin and, and, and do all of this fancy physical stuff, it's the actual emotional intelligence and, and the mentality that we learn in martial arts as well, that must have played a, a key part in, again, your success and how you how you deal with people. Yeah. I, I, again, Karim, if you take any 10-year-old uh, and drum the six tenets of Taekwondo or, or drum good life lessons, good discipline, courtesy, integrity, um, doing your best day in, day out, if, if, if a child at 10 years old is doing that for years and years and years and years, Naturally, when he stops doing that in, in the classroom of martial arts and takes it into his life, he's still going to carry on many of those traits. And that's exactly what's happened with me. And yeah. it's, it's, been, it's, it's, been, it's helped me so much. And you mentioned it, it gives you an inner confidence. The confidence is like, I feel as if I've got a backbone of steel. And in fact, that's the first time in my life I've ever told anyone. But you've just... You just know inside that, that you've achieved and you've done it and you can do it. And if the chips are down or the pressure's on, you've got the ability to do it again. Uh, do you? Th I I'll ask this as a as a, a get your opinion on this first of all. Maybe before I expand on the next part of my thinking, do you think we have a negative uh, outlook on success in this country? Because what I'm going to, what I'm going to ask you is. How has success and uh, how has business success and financial success changed you or has it changed you positively? Uh, because people, I believe, if you compare us to the US, we seem to have this negative feeling straight away for winners and success. And, and do you, you know, do you find that? Is that? Am I off there? Am I? No, you're 100% right. In the UK, if you are achieving success, you attract haters, jealousy, envy. And, and that's something I've, I've encountered. When I was earlier on in my career, I had friends. And when I achieved you know, great success, those same friends, they're un, when I met, met them, they're unable to ask me, Ajmal, how are you doing? 
that qu that simple question is too painful for them because it's going to remind them of their own inability of to, to make their business a success or it's going to highlight to them that you know that I was I'm doing okay in life. If you do well in this country, the minute you're successful, the haters are out in force. I don't know where they come from. <laughs> they're, they're in the woodwork, honestly. So and the and the jealousy. So that that's something that I've had to deal with a lot. But fortunately, mentally, I'm a very stable guy and I'm sound and I don't let anyone's negativity, criticism, slow me down or get me down. Do you find that, and I'll tell you, let, let, me, let me explain further why I ask this question because, again, it's to do with what other people can think sometimes. I think if you, I think success can and possibly should change people because what it allows you to do and that and people forget this is to enhance the already positive elements of your being or mindset or self an example if you think that you are a generous person and you become successful it allows you chance to be more generous or or have more time for people because you're not maybe working 20 hours a day now and all of this stuff so Again, we have this thing where, oh no, success would not change me. Money wouldn't change me. Mm. I think we're missing up an element of that. We're missing where it can actually posit positively change you or enhance an already really good bit of your character. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So money has made me a lot more generous with my money. I love giving to... Um, individuals or people who are down in their luck. I don't donate to big charities with fancy offices and chief executives that earn £250,000 a year. If I'm on holiday, I and I've spoken to this about this on other podcasts, so I don't really want to be seen to be boasting about my charitable initiatives or, or uh, efforts. Um, but you're right. I think if you've got money, the, uh, it, it does make you much more... It, it's made me much more generous with my money. I, I give... I give generously to people who are down in the luck. And, and the people that that really pull in my heartstrings are the people who are out there grafting, but not asking for money. So there was this, I met this lady in Pakistan. Um, I was there buying a staircase and she was carrying um, a bag full of bottles this this lady's the same age as my mother right remember in pakistan there's no nhs there's no welfare state there's none of that and i and i was walking into the factory and i said to the guys wait wait a minute i just went over to this lady she was maybe about 30 yards away i said what are you doing she goes i'm just gathering enough bottles so i can um buy some chapatis for my husband who's not well this lady is 80 years old the same age as my mother and she's out collecting plastic bottles to sell for pennies and I just gave her you know like whatever money I had in my pocket I just I just gave it to her and it's it's instances like that where I'm very very generous whereas had I met someone sitting on you know the, the pavement just asking for money I, I've got a different dynamic there so my I'm much more generous for people who are out there grafting maybe down in their luck and could just do it with a little help in hand and the great thing I think, and I'm happy to say this is great. I, I don't record it. I don't. I, I don't make a, a point of it. I don't advertise it on social media. And the only reason I'm telling you today, Kareem, is because you've asked me that question and we're talking exactly. about it. Exactly. Yep. 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 Uh, two areas that I haven't had the chance to cover on the podcast. Uh, well, one in particular is, and again, I'm I'm so happy that you you raised this small point away at the beginning. What what benefits or is there any particular benefits for children of ethnic minorities to get involved in martial arts? Because both of us were from are from ethnic minority families. Uh, in my life, growing up as a child, and I have spoken about this, the racial bullying, bullying for example, that I suffered uh, growing up was, was nothing short of horrendous. Mm. Uh, I've also said that those same people that I see who bullied me before are nothing but kind and, and nice to me now. That's a that's another story. But the martial arts definitely changed my life in that situation. The, the confidence yes. it gave me to deal with that. 
Good. And I think for anyone watching the podcast, we're based in just outside Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, 1990s, very early 90s, it was a brutal place. It was. There was a lot of racism going on. Unfortunately, that's all died down now. And I think that's one of the reasons my parents got me involved in martial arts. So at least I could hold my own out there. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it's okay now. But I remember back in the 90s, I would actually be quite fearful of walking down the street in Glasgow at night time, um, but not fearful of walking down the street in London. And the difference is, in Glasgow, I could get picked on for the colour of my skin, whereas London's very cosmopolitan. No one's going to pick on you in the color, for the colour of your skin. I mean, if it's, it could be anything else but the colour of your skin. So there always was an element of that, just walking down the street and being racially abused. So I think I'm glad my parents got me involved in that, in martial arts and uh, just helped me hold my own. What it, t- staying on that subject just for a second, but from a much more positive point of view, what I've found and what I'm still extremely proud about is that it genuinely is a place for everybody. It genuinely yeah. is a place for everyone. I have uh, many different races, ages. We forget about ages. My youngest student, we have preschool classes as well uh, that my wife runs, and they're for children three to six years or seven, and then they move into the full children's class. My oldest student, Jim Logan, was on the last episode of the podcast. He's 70 years of age, still training three or four times a week. Wow. Uh, the 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 amount of females who train now compared to when we were starting out is is my school's probably fifty fifty now, and that's for kids and for adults, males and females, uh, religions. Even though it's something that's never ever discussed, just through conversation, yeah. you know, it's a it's a community for everybody, which is an amazing. Yeah. Thing. It's good, yeah. No, I mean, uh, the place has transformed now. I mean, that's that, that was over a quarter of a century ago. I mean, the life, everything's just changed so much now. What memories do you have? And I'm hoping that they match mine's. Although you were a wee bit older, <coughs> I'm just getting that in again for all the listeners and the viewers. Uh, when we drove to Gloucestershire in 1993 for our black belt grading under the living legend, who's still thankfully with us, Grandmaster Hugh yeah. Cho. What memory yeah, that, do you have about that? That was it was a very good road, road trip. Uh, it, it was great. It was a great banter, um, and I had a great time. The most important. No one's ever going to mention this here, right? And again, I've never spoken about this. The single best thing that's ever happened in the first twenty-five years of my life was in the very first minute of that black belt grading where Grandmaster He El Cho said, 50 press-ups. We started the black belt grading by doing 50 press-ups. I stood up afterwards and my arms were about to fall off. And what that taught me, everyone can do a lot of things, but can you perform under pressure? And the most valuable lesson I learned in those first 25 years from a Taekwondo years is, um, have you got the ability to perform under pressure? And that was the most valuable lesson. It was, I remember being, I mean, I was I was 11 years of age. Uh, and I often think whether you, you're actually remembering things or you're remembering remembering things, if that makes sense. It's just something right. that maybe created uh, in your head. But to go on a road trip with yourself and a couple other guys to go and do this black belt, which to me as an 11 year old seemed a world away. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just a drive down, down to England. It was, it was a world away to, to go and do this. Uh, I always remember that Grandmaster had, had two tone shoes on. And this is such a weird memory. <laughs> like oh, man. back in the day, I would think of like the way that Bugsy Malone would have wore. And he walked oh, and, as an 11-year-old, now, obviously, you were well into your teens, so you would have been having maybe more mature sort of outlooks and thinking what you were looking. And strangely, <laughs> I thought, this man's got two own shoes on, and I've got no idea why that sticks with me, but it's just one of those strange, strange memories of yeah. this brilliant day. Uh, 
which was, if my math is correct, 31 years ago. Yeah, crazy. And at that time, we would have gone to the black belt dating, you're hoping that you pass, and then we did pass. And, oh, yeah, I passed my black belt. Oh, well done. And it's only now when you look back, or when you look back after a few th- years, and you think, bloody hell, that was an achievement. That yeah. was a major, major achievement. But at that time, you don't really realise it. What, what I'm trying to do, and again, you, you can only sweep your own side of the street. You can only look after your own corner sometimes. Uh, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we don't we don't move away from what you and I achieved. That's mm. really, you, you touched on this. Uh, getting seven-year-old black belts, getting black belt in two years. Uh, maybe you should concentrate on the positives. I, I get that, but it's it's hard sometimes when when these things are happening to something that you're most yeah. about as as I am. I'm trying to maintain the level that you and I were asked to reach. Yeah, in modern times, thirty years later. It's yeah. really, really difficult. It's, it is really difficult. Yeah, I think you should just stick to your course. If you believe that's the way, and deep down, you and I both know that is that is the right way. If you want to churn out elite martial artists, good people, good disciplined athletes, effectively, um, you've got to put them through the mill. You, you can't give them an easy time and a pat in the back every now and again and say, right, there you go, I'm just going to give you some handouts. Life yeah. doesn't work like that. Let me ask you a couple of direct questions just as we get yeah. towards the end uh, or the back end of the hour here. Uh, what would be your key advice? And I'm, I'll leave this quite a broad question. I'm just going to say your key advice for achieving success because there's people who listen to the podcast who will be interested in success in martial arts. I'm hoping there'll be people that will, will uh, focus in on your expertise now and yeah. look for business success. But just in life in general, what advice can you give us, the listeners and the viewers? Uh, you've got to, this is cliche, you've got to work hard. You've got to turn up when you don't want to. You've got to have the discipline. You've got to embrace the fact that um, the road to success is lonely, long, boring, full of mundane tasks. You don't have many friends along the way. Um, and just, you've got to sprinkle all of that with a certain amount of risk as well. If you just work hard, you're effectively a donkey. Now, you don't see many successful donkeys around, so you've got to add in all of the other elements as well. So take all of those elements and sprinkle a generous amount of risk, um, and that can be the difference between achieving massive success or not. So two big risks I took in my life. One, um, I decided to uproot myself from Glasgow and take myself down to London. I operated in a whole different commercial league down there with the, the, the biggest consultants in the world, dealing with the best clients. Uh, and then the big, second big risk is when I achieved my dream life, I said, I'm going to leave all of that and start my business from scratch. And then I built up from there. So risk is very important as well. One other direct question that I have, and we were discussing this, excuse me, excuse me, we were discussing discussing this at the class, the class that I had on Tuesday night. And what some of the lower grades were asking the black belts was how they stayed motivated. So when you sold your business to move into the new business, what inspires you to keep going? Um, it, it gets to a point where it's not about the money. Uh, I could re- retire today, but intellectually, and I need to keep myself stimulated and business can be incredibly fun. Um, and I just, I keep motivated with the fact, knowing the fact that I am building something hopefully very big and exciting. So that's, and that challenge, because it's slightly out of my reach, um, it just makes it much more interesting, exciting and rewarding. What about you as a as as a, what's the personal element to that? What's the what what you build is is obviously has a reflection on yourself and your own achievement. But as a as a person, what's your driving force? What's what's the thing that 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 makes you go and make the deal as opposed to 
sending someone else to make the deal? What's you that who goes to look at a certain property instead of sending someone else to look at a property? What keeps you in in the game, so to speak? I think I've always been a bit of a control freak. Uh, <laughs> okay, nice honest. I, 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 I think it, in business, in life, in martial arts, the success is in the tiny details. Um, it's not in the big movements. It's not in the big moves. And a lot of people have criticised me over the years for being a control freak. But that, to me, that just means that I like to just make sure that important things are done correctly. And that can often be the difference between success and failure. Something else, just before I let you go, and I will, I will do. Yeah. I won't keep you too much longer. This is great. I'm loving this conversation, Kareem. It's one of the best I've had. It's... What I sometimes say is, 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 and people think that I'm probably fibbing then, that these things aren't planned. These questions in this conversation, it's not planned. But probably about three times in my classes so far this week, I have said to students, where's the devil? Where's the mm. devil? Mm. And they've came back correctly and said, in the detail. And yeah. it's so funny that you've just you've just expressed that as well. The expert who's on the show is backing up what I'm telling my students. Good. That's planned. That's just great minds. <laughs> well done, well done. It, it so is, but it, you, you, everything, everything, that devil is in the detail. Find it and, and you'll get there. Right, okay. Not a question, but just to finish up, I want to give you an opportunity uh, just to possibly express a, a last message to the viewers or the, the, the listeners. Uh any sort of advice that we've not covered or any message that you want to send out to the community just before we we finish up? Yeah, I think if you're, if you're doing martial arts today, uh, you may not see the benefit today, tomorrow or next year, but fast forward a few years and you will look back and you'll be glad that you undertook this journey. Um, secondly, I would say if you're a, a student of Kareem or Master Kareem, to me, you're just me, Kareem. So I, I've That's got the fine. authority to say you're just me, Kareem. <laughs> but to anyone else, it's Master Kareem. Um, anyone else, I would say, if you're under the stewardship of Master Kareem, great guy, I've known him for 40 years, uh, and he'll always have your back, and he'll make sure he's teaching you to the very best of his ability. Um, and sometimes those lessons maybe not be as they might not be as exciting as you want them to be, but they're very important. They're the foundation building blocks of your success. The best instructors or coaches or teachers in any walk of life uh, should not give the student what they want, but what they need. Exactly. That's, that's a brilliant message. Exactly. Okay, Ajmal Mushtaq, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I'm really, really chuffed that we got this done and we got it arranged so quickly and managed just to do it. Uh, yeah. It's probably a conversation that we should have had this very early on when the podcast got started, but we finally got together to do it. So honestly, I genuinely cannot thank you enough for coming on. It's been brilliant. I wish you all the best, Kareem. Thanks very much. It's been, it's, it's been actually one of my most interesting conversations. Brilliant. Uh, it took me back to our childhood. Um, and we had a lot of good times back then and uh, what a journey we've been on 100% okay yeah. thank you so much thank you so much we'll thank, you. thank you take care thanks bye bye thank you thank you thanks bye